brighter and better tomorrow. Good night. God bless you. And welcome Owen Seymour Arthur. Good evening to you, and, and you know it, we have to take a Kerry Simmons to bring me to give what is going to be my fifth speech for the night. I, I come because we have a duty, no matter what it takes out of you, to remove this government from office. And my first message is a message of assurance and reinsurance to you. Some of you would have seen the polls today. I might have been a little concerned about it. But the poll itself is a worst case scenario that basically tells you that at the very worst, the Barbados Labour Party will win at least 17 of the 30 seats in the next election. At the worst, at least 17 of the 30. So that at the very worst, this party will constitute the very next government of Barbados. And just be cool. I would have, from these platforms, have told you that the race is not over. And that you are not to behave like you same bull who believes that you can put your hand in the air. That we are up against a very vicious enemy. A vicious foe, I should say. And that the Democratic Labour Party will do everything in its power to try to win the government. I also must let you know that the nature of elections is such that at some stage, Kerry, are the young ladies in your constituency a cousin to Christmas noise at night? <laughs> but darling, I might want to see you too, but my wife is here. And it is that kind of hour in the morning. Do not do these things to me. That's why I get this kind of bad reputation. And the lady is a kind of plump lady. And I like them little plump. Heat when it's cold. Shade when it's hot. Do not do these things to me. Anyhow. The Labour Party has to be aware. That at some stage in this election. The Dems will become Dems again. And that all this poll is telling you is that that moment has arrived. That no matter how embarrassed the Dems are of their government, the Dems will become Dems. And that the poll is telling you that the political leadership career that Chris Sinclair has sought is over. The Dems have decided to throw Chris Sinclair under the bus because they are holding him responsible. Madam, Madam, I'm accustomed to whispering and I don't want to have to shout to override you. So you give me a chance, please. God bless you, darling. Anyhow, this election poll is telling you that the Dems have decided that they don't want any part of Sinclair because of what he has done on the privatization issue, what he has done on the Clico issue, and that they left with no alternative but to go with friendly sure. So at least we want know one thing for sure, that the ambitions for leadership of Chris Sinclair 
have come to an end. And the Dems are going back home. And this election now is to be decided by the independent-minded people who are neither B's nor D's. And we now have to continue to give those persons who are not Labour Party people a continued justification for voting for us in this election. And, this in, and in this election, we have sought to give you that justification by the quality of the platform that we have mounted. The, the media today asked me, how do I feel by the fact that 95% of all of the speeches of the Dems attack me? And they tell me, it doesn't bother me. That is my life. It is well with my soul. I also tell them that the Democratic Labour Party attacking me is obviously a sign of respect. They are showing a strange way to show respect. And that the respect has to come from the fact that they believe that I stand between them and their victory. So that if they're attacking me, then it doesn't bother me. And the poll that says that I am behind um, Mr. Frandell Stewart doesn't bother me either. And I wish that you all would stop being bothered about it. By it. Because in 2008, if you will remember, a poll was done by Wickham in January 2008 that showed the Dems winning, but that I was preferred to David Thompson. So if the polls now say that we are winning, but Frandell is preferred to me, well then, cool. Let them prefer Frandell, but elect the Barbados Labour Party. Die cool with that. <laughs> so let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. This has been the best campaign that the Barbados Labour Party has mounted in my 28 years of, of, of politics. It has been by far the best. And we have dealt with a lot of stuff in this campaign. We have tried the Democratic Labour Party. We have dealt with the referendum and told you they don't deserve on the basis of performance to govern you. We have held up a manifesto and told you that this is a superior program for the future of this country. And they can't match it. And for the rest of the campaign, I have to deal with the issue that only I can deal with. Now, in the final analysis, it comes down, it is, it is all about leadership. And that our Barbadian society has been a strong society, has been a good society because of the quality of the leadership that we have enjoyed. It has not been about natural resources or bought site or goal. Barbados has always been well governed and have had leaders, strong leaders, that have been able to hold this country to a successful course. Our strong leaders have not been like the captain of that Greek ship that was the first man that ran the ship around. We're with my name again. But uh, he was the first man to jump off and enter the lifeboats. Held the country to a course. And, and, and tonight, uh, for the rest of the campaign, it has to be, begin to be said that Barbados needs a leader who can manage and govern and develop the economy. All through our history, the Prime Minister has been Minister of Finance. Errol Barrow was Prime Minister and Minister of Finance because he understood the importance of the economy in building a society. Tom Adams was Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Erskine Sandiford was Prime Minister, Bree St. John was Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Erskine Sandiford was Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. I was Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. And in his own kind of strange way, David Thompson was a prime minister and a kind of minister of finance. Even he understood 
that the leadership Barbados required was a leadership that, on the, that recognized that a society required an economy that was strong to carry it and that the real primary role of a prime minister was to give economic leadership to this country. And it is not by chance, therefore, that all prime ministers have sought to give that economic direction. What you have now is a prime minister who take refuge in philosophy, love to quote a lot of scriptures, but expresses his economic ineptitude by asking you, the people of Barbados, to accept a false ideology. That you can pay too much attention to the economy, but that you can build a society without dealing with the economy. And they feel that the Barbados Labour Party must regard it as a badge of honor at a time when our people are sucking salt to be told that we will pay too much attention to the economy. Because I'm absolutely sure that that is, that is precisely what you want your government to do, to take an economy that has been broken and fix it. And, and that the notion that you can pay too much attention to an economy must never fall from the mouth of a leader in this country, especially at a time, especially at a time when this economy is like a broken vessel, especially at a time when you, the ordinary citizen, cannot see the future, cannot pay your way, are hurting, can't pay for electricity, touching from the bailiffs, sometimes have a difficulty putting a meal on your table for your children on Sundays. You must come to accept that your prime minister must have economic competence. And the Democratic Labour Party has failed because its leader does not understand that fundamental to leading this country is to do what Barrow did, what Adams did, what Sandiford did, what St. John did, what Thompson did, and what he did. A prime minister also must be a person who makes decisions. You have to decide. And the charge against Randall Stewart has not come only from the Barbados Labour Party. It has come from his own. The charge against Randall Stewart that has not yet been answered by his own is that he has brought a new kind of inertia to bear in the highest places in the land. The, the, the man, as if he suffers from the dropsy, cannot make decisions. And, and I have described him over and over again as he, is, he wants to be a philosopher like Aristotle and Plato. And he has a lot in common with them. They are dead, and he is dead too. And, and I have cited for you Shakespeare, that he is a meek, inconsequential man, fit only to run errands. That is from them. And I have keep describing to him to you in the words of James Joyce when I first saw him. I said, whoa. James Joyce. Dubliners, a painful case. Mr. Duffy says Mr. Duffy was always at a little distance from his own body, observing his own actions with doubtful side glances. That's Frandell. Can't decide observing his own actions with doubtful side glances. He, he says Mr. Duffy had an odd autobiographical habit or from time to time composing a sentence about himself in his own mind, with the subject in the third person, and the predicate in the past tense. That is Frandell. 
He says he had no friends. He says he had a character that a medieval doctor would call Saturnine. His life went on an adventureless tale. That is Randell. A painful case as described by James Joyce. But we know that the only thing that he is good at is not knowing how to make decisions. And finding the most empty excuses for not being able to do that which a prime minister must do to decide. Click off. 35,000 Barbadians are sucking salt because a prime minister decides that he does not want to act and invent the argument that he can't act because the report was stolen. Have you ever heard a more ignorant piece of nonsense from a prime minister? At Alexander School, the man says that he has to go through phases. So he must be the moon, full moon, whatever else, closest thing. Have you ever heard a man going through phases? So he's in phase two. But even when he come to the end of the exercise, the problem has not been solved because he cannot make decisions. A prime minister of the country must also Inspire the country to higher heights by the power and the quality of his words. And, and set a vision for the country and a course for the country by what he says and how he says it. In my time, I told you that Barbadians should aspire to become the world's smallest developing, developed country and we achieved it. That, that we should look to abolish poverty in this country. That we should aim at full employment and we came as close to that as possible. As a Prime Minister, I tell you all, let us deal with HIV AIDS in a civil way and stop the stigma of our folks. How does your leader speak to you? He said Barbadians have a barbecue pigtail mentality. <laughs> now don't laugh at it. We are a proud people who have been held up in the world as the beacons of aspiration. And that Barbados has always been cited as a society of good people, progressive people, who have been the marvel of the civilized world for bringing civilized development to our country. And our Prime Minister tells us that we have a barbecue pigtail mentality. And then he performs a Romney. In America, United States people refuse to elect Romney because he tells them that at least 47% of them, all they wanted to do was to depend upon the government and what handouts. And you remember what Romney said that? And the American people said, no kind of leader like you can lead us. You've got to show some respect. We don't want to hand outs. But Frandell was even worse than Romney. He said that Barbadians are sucking on the government's nipples <laughs> to the point where they are very sore. <laughs> now, this is not something to laugh at. Barbadians today are hurting. My people are proud people. My people just want the opportunity to aspire. And they want a government to give them the incentives and the means to match opportunity with aspiration. Barbadians want to live in a successful society. Barbadians want not to depend upon the government, but to make the government strong and to make this country to be is like a shining city on a hill. And you hear of a prime minister that tells you that all you want to do is to suck on the government's nipples to the point where they are sore? Does he reflect the Barbadian personality? And then he tells you 
They are all highly educated persons. Who, who's that? But it's the damn welcome. I'm the first time they're hearing a good meeting, man. Don't send the baby people. Welcome them. Friend, don't send them here to be enlightened. Don't do that to them. I don't friend them, please. But, but I have to go on. And, and then he tells you that with all these highly educated and qualified people in the public service, and they can't solve the problem at Alexander School, they should go back to the cane fields. There has never been a bigger insult in Barbados than to tell Barbadians, to hold Barbadians responsible for the failure to deal with Alexander and tell you that your future should be that you should go back to the cane fields. And then the man tell you that if it's money that you want to get put in your pocket, but don't look to the government. He said, look to drug traders and look to the criminal element. But when you are to look to drug traders and the criminal element, cost you less down the road, can depend upon the government to put all of their dividends in their pockets without taxes. And there are certain companies in this country that are giving the contracts then they are loaned to build all the houses in certain places. And they are soon going to be given the contract to build at Havers, at Paradise, and to build 2,000 houses in Bushy Park. But the government can't put money in your pocket, but it can put all of the money in theirs. And the Prime Minister looks on at this and disparages you. That don't look to the government to put money in your pockets. But perhaps he's right. Because all, after they have put all in certain pockets, none is left for you. But a prime minister must not talk to the people of Barbados in these terms. Our people deserve better. And, and if Frandell has disqualified himself, from the right of leadership, it is because he has insulted the people in a way that no other leader would dare do. And, and they want, because it is it, and they don't want to go on too long, much longer to say that when the Prime Minister becomes a Prime Minister, he takes an oath to uphold the law and, and to make sure that the country is governed by the rule of law. And he has to protect the Constitution. And the Constitution of Barbados says that there should be a cabinet. And that the cabinet should be governed by a precept called collective responsibilities. And that the Prime Minister is the chairman of the cabinet. And he has a duty as a leader of the country to ensure that collective responsibility is the basis of our government. And the Prime Minister fails, then his cabinet becomes a group of wild boys. Each doing what they feel like. And nobody is there to make sure that Barbados has a good governance without which this country cannot be stable. How can you be in a cabinet as a minister and write a letter to your officers to tell them that they cannot go to a meeting assembled by a ministry of finance and the prime minister does not fire you? Because that is a breach of collective responsibility. How can you serve in a cabinet as a minister of finance? And the cabinet says that a letter of credit, a letter of comfort must be signed for Anson McCall to provide the funding to build the Barbados Water Authority headquarters. And the minister of finance said he ain't signing it and doesn't get fired. How can our cabinet government be serious if, as you have recently seen, David Eswick again goes to a meeting organized by the government, pelts away his speech, and says, unless I get money, enough money from the Minister of Finance, the shop shut. 
had done a walk. And he is not fired. And, and we must not make light of these things. Because the first thing you do to become a prime minister is to take an oath. And the oath says that you are there to make sure that the law is upheld. And this country is now distinguishing itself as a society where the rule of law means nothing. Kerry, in your constituency, what is attempted to be done at Bagatelle reflects a government that has no interest in the rule of law. Recycling in Barbados is a good project, but any recycler must abide by the law. I have nothing against the binos, but I went to King Garden. They put up a recycling facility without having planning permission. And they were told, the town planner says, push it down. I said, town planner, I was the minister then. I said, town planner, recycling is a good industry for Barbados. Don't just push them down. Give them three years to find an alternative. I, mean, I offered to work with them to carry the recycling facility over to Vaucluse because Vaucluse has virtually emerged as a place for solid waste management. And if you can have recycling, have it over there. But a deal has been cut. And these things are wrong. And they weren't talking about. He gets into an arrangement with Thompson that he has a piece of land at River Bay. And he offers the government part of the land at River Bay that I refuse to agree to do. And they want to say these things. That if you go and buy land in Barbados in an environmentally sensitive place, do not expect a Labour Party government to give you planning permission to develop it. There's a man called Benjamin. He went to his death hating me eventually because he wanted to have people with a resort, build a resort in the sand dunes of St. Andrew, and they told him no. And they became the worst person in the world. And they would have received planning applications to have a resort at River Bay. And I did not believe, as I don't believe, that our Barbados would be the same Barbados if the most scenic place in our country is desecrated by letting one man put a resort there. And if you go and buy land in an environmentally sensitive place, do not expect a government to offend good environmental and ecological considerations by giving you commercial permission. But by news, got an agreement that they'll exchange a piece of the land at River Bay for the land at Fort Denmark and the acreage of land at Bagatelle. But that's not even the point I'm making to you. The point I'm making to you is this. That nobody, the binos have to know that you just can't go and put an a, 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 a recycling facility in and everywhere. They must know from their King Garden experience that you have to go through the process of applying for a planning permission. And that a recycling facility will raise environmental considerations and that the planning permission will have to await an environmental impact assessment before any action is taken. But what happened in Barbados is that the government led by Frandel Stewart, who is the Minister of Planning and should have read the Town Planning Act, says don't mind the law. Ignore the fact that the law says that you have to go through the process of applying for permission and that you have to do an environmental impact assessment to see how it affects those people down there. Ignore that and let the cabinet take the place of the law. So the thing went straight to cabinet as if 
in our land, the cabinet doesn't have to uphold the law. The cabinet can feel that it is above the law. And the issue at Bagatelle is a very, very serious issue. Because once a government comes to believe that it is above the law, and that what the law says must apply, don't have to apply, because the cabinet can determine otherwise, you have to begin to ask where that is going to end. Because we must be a society whose democracy rests on the respect for the rule of law. And I want to commend all of the citizens of this district who, in protection of our wider democracy, but in, in their own neighborhood self-interest, have decided that this is the kind of case that must be tested in court. And the whole of Barbados is with you because government does not have the right to behave like a tyrant. And no matter what the, how sweet the deal may be, the law must be made to apply. And it goes on and on and on. And the more we complain about the Democratic Labour Party breaking the law, the more they feel emboldened to break the law. And the most recent now, as you might have heard, is that the Democratic Labour Party have granted themselves an FM radio license to have their own radio station to do political broadcasts. Now, the license given by the DLP to itself with the accompanying frequencies for the purpose of broadcasting their political meetings is in breach of the law governing political broadcasting during an election period. The law sets out certain rules that must apply to how political parties can access the airwaves during an election season in respect of political broadcasts. And that these things are vested in the Electoral and Boundaries Commission. And we have had to follow the rules. We get two broadcasts. The Dems get three. Ours was half an hour tonight. But no political party is supposed to be able to join an election time to do political broadcasts outside the rules set by the Electoral and Boundaries Commission. And if a political party can come during the course of an election itself and break the law in respect of how that election itself must be conducted, then I say that we are on a certain course to social anarchy in this country. I mean, they're not even hiding now. The law says one thing, and the Democratic Labour Party says we do not have to respect the law. And it is a law about how elections and election broadcasts are to be undertaken. Now, when you start playing with these things, the question really must begin to arise. Eventually, what kind of society are we going to eventually inherit in this country? If you have a government that is not interested in the economy, you have a government that is not interested at the highest level in making decisions. You have a government that believes that the law is there to be mocked. You have a government that does not believe in the principle of collective responsibility. You have ministers who feel that they are law unto themselves. 
What kind of society are we in the process of creating? I maybe speak therefore to you in terms of a better tomorrow. It is not just about dealing with the cost of living, although that is important. It is not just about fixing your economy in general and giving back cylinders to this aircraft that has lost all its cylinders. It is not just about fixing back education and health, although that those are important, or making sure that the housing sector is open to all contractors and not just one, although that is important. It is not just about starting back the vision that every community should have a, a road and there were roads started up here that have not been finished. It is not just about our believing that we can have an economy for the youth that is designed for the youth. It is not only about these things. It is about what will be the character of the Barbadian society that we will create and who will shape that character and in what mirror image will that character be shaped. Barbados is on a brink, a dangerous, dangerous brink. And it is not just an economic brink, but it's a brink that can lead us to social anarchy. And in this election, our people must be told that we are not just in danger of falling behind and being left behind, but we are in danger of going under. And when you have this fatal cocktail of economic mismanagement, social disintegration, lawlessness in the highest places, it is time to change. So that it is about leadership. And our problems are such that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Good night. God bless each and every one of you.